thank you so much for joining Telfair Museums for our first um, visual virtual artist talk. Um, my name's Erin Dunn. I'm the Associate Curator of Modern Contemporary Art. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the artist talk for Breakout, a site-specific public art installation at the Jepson Center by local artist Amiri Ferris. While the museum currently remains closed to the public, the wonderful thing is that you can still experience Breakout by walking or driving by the exterior windows on Barnard Street at the Jepson Center. So I hope that you will all have a chance to do that very soon. I really wanna thank everyone for joining us with this new format. And while I wish I could see your faces, I welcome this opportunity for technology to bring us together, even as we remain apart. I even have to give a shout out to my parents who've just signed on to the lecture. Um, this is the first talk they've been able to attend. Um, so technology certainly has its advantages. Um, I do briefly want to give you a rundown of the format today and explain a few features on the Zoom webinar format if you haven't attended before and how you can help participate in the new technology. Um, in the next few minutes, I will introduce the exhibition and Amiri and we'll then share a PowerPoint with images of the works in progress um, and installed. Amiri will then provide some background on the project as I move through those slides. Afterwards, I'll ask Amiri a few questions um, followed by time for questions from the audience. If you have a question, I ask that you please ask it in the chat box and I will do my very best to keep track of all the questions that are coming in and share that with Amiri. Um, in addition, this lecture will be recorded and available uh, to view after the fact on our exhibition webpage. First, I do have a few thank yous. I wanna extend my thanks to Telfair Museum's member group, Friends of African American Art for co-sponsoring this event. I also want to thank all my Telfair colleagues, especially Director of Collections and Exhibitions, Jessica Estes, who does it all and helped Amiri install the project with her toddler in tow. I also extend my thanks to Senior Curator of Education, Harry DeLorme, who has been instrumental in pivoting from on-site programming to virtual tours um, and Zoom lectures to make sure Telfair Museums is still able to bring exciting programming to our audiences. Um, and this includes an upcoming lecture for Juneteenth on June 18th at 5 p.m. So I hope everyone can tune into that. And of course, I have to thank Amiri for his vision, for the countless hours he spent working on the project, and for his positive and enthusiastic energy he brought to every aspect of it. So Breakout, it's the fifth installation for Telfair's annual call to artists, Box In Breakout, which began in the spring of 2016. For the past five years, the project has continued to offer local artists an opportunity to create a museum-sponsored public art installation that involves activating six windows um, that face Barnard Street at the Jepson Center. The artist is chosen by a guest judge based on set criteria, and that artist has no affiliation to Chatham County. Box and Breakout is also part of Telfair Museum's Art 912 initiative which is dedicated to raising the visibility and promoting the vitality of artists living and working in Savannah. The guest judge this year was Dr. Jonathan Walls, the Director of Curatorial Affairs and Curator of American Art at the Columbus Museum in Georgia. And he chose um, Amiri's proposal out of many great submissions, writing that, quote, of the portfolios reviewed, Amiri Ferris's proposal best met or exceeded the expectations for the project's criteria of creativity and originality, feasibility, resourcefulness, visual appeal, and suitability to the space. Two form and content issues in particular captured my attention. First, the artist's reuse or repurposing of discarded materials seems timely, timely given the urgent state of global environmental concerns. Second, as a curator, I often muse upon the power concentrated in museums and who is represented within those institutions. Seeing oneself reflected in a collection object, staff member, or museum trustee can be a powerful experience. Ferris's proposal to picture members from a range of Savannah communities, past and present, sounds compelling, and based on the artist's previous work, I'm eager to see the final results. Well, the final results are in, and you can walk by um, the Barnard Street windows now to see that. Just to give you a brief description of the project, it features five large-scale assemblages that layer and juxtapose images of present-day Savannah inhabitants um, with references to Gola traditions and African-American history and narrative. I'm sorry, I'm gonna pause really quick. Amiri, would you be able to mute your mic 
I think my voice is coming through your phone and it's causing a little feedback for people. I'm sorry to pause the program. I just want to make sure it's a good experience for everyone listening. <laughs> He's there. <laughs> All right, maybe, is that better? Can everyone hear? Sounds like the feedback is gone. Um, great, I'm glad. <laughs> All right, so just back to the description of the exhibition. Thank you, everyone. See, this is what the chat is for, so this is wonderful. Um, so he's, you know, with these large-scale assemblages, he's layering present-day Savannah inhabitants with references to Gullah traditions and African-American history and narrative. The works are made from various recycled and found materials, including boxes and paper bags. Combining these reworked objects with his unique printmaking process, Ferris blurs the boundaries between abstraction and representation, sculpture and printmaking, and contemporary and traditional. Ferris writes of his own artistic practice. I like to see artwork that will take one medium and use it to do something else. Artwork that is bold, expressive, and completely different. In addition to being inspired by the materials around him to create dynamic and colorful pieces, Ferris also looks to his own life as he creates works that are full of intimate personal experiences and examinations of subjects that are compelling to him, including issues surrounding diaspora, culture, memory, and perception. And now I would like to introduce the artist. Amiri Gueca Ferris is a contemporary multidisciplinary artist who uses a wide range of work encompassing painting, drawing, video, performance, and installation. He received his MFA in painting and his BFA in illustration and graphic design from the Savannah College of Art and Design. His academic appointments include Professor of Fine Art and Foundations and Graphic Design at Georgia Southern University and Professor of Fine Arts at the University of South Carolina, Beaufort. His work has been featured in more than 50 solo exhibition and juried museum exhibitions across the US including the United States Capitol in Washington, D.C. and the Smithsonian. Amiri, we are so excited to have you join us for this program today, and I can't wait to begin. Um, the first thing that we're going to start with is this really incredible poem that Amiri has composed. We were trying to think of a way to respond to events that are happening right now in today's society as we come face to face with inequality and injustice perpetrated on people of color by uh, the police and systemic racism. And Amiri is going to share that poem with you now. So thank you so much. Unmute. Hi, can you hear me, everyone? OK, awesome. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Aaron uh, was very lovely and um, so humbled to take part in the, the program. Um, like I said, I'd like to start off with the poem that I wrote called Black Squares. Don't put me in your box. Digital hashtags like pixels of deception. Stop. Break out bread together, fresh, not stale. Walk next to me. Don't run swiftly ahead, never looking back. Together, we were in dreams, not nightmares. Remember our hopes that one day we would change reality. Holding hands, singing, dancing, the children of the future. Space, deep, like Malcolm, Martin. Nightingale, dust of stars twinkling with the lights of passion. Brighter than any knowledge we know, but can we breathe? No, you stream us, cover us with mass of disparities, linked in the love of natural connection. Don't teach me to hate. Let us create, let us be. We are all spectrums of colors, not black or white, but cocoa, melanin, golden, delicious drips of color painted together on a canvas. Beautiful cardboards of diversity. If you put me in your black square, do so holding hands, clenching tightly together, real like the winds changing, blowing on the sun's breath of a new day. 
I am you and you are me. Nova's hoping for a brighter universe. Let us together reclaim the dream. Thank you so much. That was really powerful. I appreciate you sharing that with us all. Oh, well, thank you. I hope everyone uh, enjoys it. But I felt that, you know, I wanted to say something. Um, and when I can't say something visually like what I normally do, then, um, you know, I try to do it through poetry or other means. Um, so I decided to write a poem I thought that would best would be the best way to suit my feelings. Wonderful. And I think now we can see, um, I'm going to show a PowerPoint of some images so you can see how you're also kind of visually expressing yourself um, in a lot of ways. So I'm going to open up the PowerPoint, share my screen, and just kind of scroll through it and allow you to kind of um, speak over the images, Amiri, and please let me know if I need to pause on anything or move, move on. <laughs> okay, sounds good. All right, so um, these images here are a colorism series. So this is a series um, that's currently showing um, here at Sofrot Studios, um, which we're recording at. And so this series dealt with colorism. Um, so it's all about judging people's uh, skin tone um, by colorism. Um, so each one of the pieces is a different aspect of me. They're different self-portraits. And so the piece that you're looking at is uh, the white version of myself and the other version. So I know we're all familiar with filling out those boxes when we're going for a job interview or filling out a grant or trying to get a loan. Um, and you have to put what race you are. So I wanted to incorporate that. You can see that up at the top over the eye. Um, so in each one of the pieces, um, it talks about that. And then also at the bottom. And I guess we can go on to the next slide. Um, and this is a series, um, again, that's based on the colorism exhibit uh, that I was putting together. And this is the brown bag series. And so you can see some earlier pieces where I was using actual brown bags. And this is a series that has to do with um, issues in the African-American community where we judge each other by the color, the color of a bag. So if you're lighter than a brown bag or just around, then you can pass in white society. But if you're darker than that, then you're considered um, you know, not as beautiful and maybe you can't um, pass as much. So in these pieces, I try to use uh, African American women as the subject matter. And again, using actual um, brown bags. Um, so this is one of the earlier works where I used reclaimed materials. And this is some of the uh, reclaimed materials. So I go around to different uh, dumpsters and outside some large uh, areas. And you can see how there's just boxes and boxes of of reclaimed uh, materials. So I go through that and kind of find those pieces um, that I think would work interesting uh, or work well in the artwork. But I just thought, um, you know, it shows how much we use cardboard and boxes and things like that. Um, the, the whole parking lot, as you can see, behind the supermarket was filled um, with those reclaimed materials. And this is me working on some of the work um, here at Sofer Studios. Um, so you can see that's when I started collaging and we'll talk uh, more about that, I, I guess, as we're going forward with the talk. And this is the work as I started to finish up um, adding more color and layer uh, and patterning to the work.
and you can see this is some of the details uh, in the work of one of the pieces. So I tried to use um, old photographs um, that I found and I've been collecting um, the history of Savannah and then also different elements from comic books and video games. And again, you can see some of the details. So as you look closer, closer into the artwork, um, like usual, I try to hide things in the artwork. So you'll see the overall um, figure. And then as you look deeper into the artwork, you'll start to see, again, images that have to relate to the past, present, and future of Savannah. And again, you can see some of the, the older images. There's the um, old train station in Savannah, which I just find that building very beautiful in Broughton Street. And I think that might be the last. And there's some of the boxes that I'm working on in my studio. And so now we can see the pieces uh, at the Jepson Center on the outside of the windows. Um, so before we were looking at it in my studio, and now you can, um, we're seeing them in the museum. Oh, yeah. Looks awesome. I, I love them. <laughs> well, that's great. Now that everyone kind of has a little bit of background about what the art or what the works look like and what they look like in situ, um, we can kind of dive into some questions I prepared for you. The first one was kind of just <laughs> general because I know that we've all been dealing with a lot of stress in our lives and kind of upheavals. Um, around the pandemic and having to kind of shut down what we had been working on before. So I was just curious what your experience was as an artist during this time. Um, has it provided any sources of inspiration for you or has it been a frustrating time? Hmm, yeah, I think it's definitely an interesting time right now that we're in. I think personally, I've been trying to just reflect and meditate on the next steps in my life and what projects I wanted to work on. Um, I feel like a lot of my projects did get canceled. So I had a couple of other museum shows and, um, and festivals and things like that that I was working on. But um, I was able to focus my energy on creating like this series of works and new series of works. So uh, I felt that having that time made my work stronger. Um, and I also started a nonprofit called Slay, support uh, low country artists. And so we helped get funding to uh, low country artists out here in Savannah, Charleston, um, everywhere in the low country. Um, and I just felt that it was very important to help artists that were in financial dire need, you know, as we were going through the pandemic. Um, and right now, after we're moving through the pandemic, I wanted to keep working with Slay and keep developing it. So now we're mentoring artists and helping them become more established. Um, because as you know, as you're starting out as an artist, um, you know, in the field, you have so many questions and so many different things that you need help with. Um, so that's what we're doing right now. So you, again, Rachel. I think it's a very interesting time. It truly is, as we both sit in our home in our studio, 
um, instead mm. of in the auditorium to the artist talk. But I think we're still able to hopefully impart um, about the project to everyone. And of course, they are, can walk by. I know someone asked how long the exhibit is up for. Um, we don't have a kind of ending date because we installed the exhibition later than we originally planned. We're kind of leaving it up for a little bit longer. So I expect it to be up through the end of the year. Um, and we will update uh, at the time that we know when it will come down. So thank you for asking that. Um, and then I think I wanted to ask just uh, turning to the works themselves and the materials you use. Um, in your proposal, you wrote boxes and bags can contain things or move things from one location to another. And as a creative person, I don't like to be put in a box. And so I love how you really reference the title of the project, Boxed In, Break Out. Um, but you're also using your, that chosen theme to revisit a lot of the previous works you had already been working on both in terms of material and content. Um, so I guess I was interested in how recycling has been part of your process, artistic process, in terms of revisiting old ideas you've worked on and also revisiting materials you use. Yeah, so I know in my studio, for instance, I had all these boxes and bags and old artworks that I had sitting around and it's like, oh, you know, one day I'm gonna do something with those artworks. And, gonna you know rework them and I was saving up you know bags and boxes for like this monumental big piece of artwork um and then I saw the call for entries and something just kept telling me you know this is a good opportunity to use those materials and you really want to use reclaimed materials in a larger way so I was glad that I was able um to do that and then I was I was working on the project I started thinking of the metaphor to my own life, like how these boxes and bags um, relate to my own life. Um, and I started taking on the mentality, which I already had before, was thinking out of the box. Like I always thought about, you know, as an artist and uh, myself, you know, I have kind of a different name and I kind of stand out that, you know, I really wanted to think out of the box and be out of the box. And I know like in today's society, um, everyone is kind of must fit into these boxes to be successful, to know where you fit in, in the world. Um, so as I kept going, I wanted to break those stereotypical um, feelings. And again, you know, really think about breaking out of the box. Um, and I think, once you stop kind of conforming so much, you can achieve so much more in life. So, you know, once you stop doing traditional things, so someone asked the question, you know, why would you use reclaimed materials instead of using, you know, traditional canvas and paintings? Because again, it's thinking out of the box and using materials that someone might throw away, but I'm using them to create new contemporary works of art. So I felt that that was um, very strong and just very different and do something that, you know, another artist um, in the area might not be doing. Um, and I know, for instance, as an artist, I find it so frustrating that I have to constantly fit into those boxes. Like uh, a lot of people say, oh, you're a painter, so you have to stick with painting, or you're a sculptor, you have to stick with sculpting, or you're a muralist. So you should just stick with that. But I think as a creative people, um, we just want to uh, express ourselves as much as we can. So um, I think using all those materials and again, not being stuck inside that box and really break out as the title says, um, again, I think you can do so much more. Um, but I still want to focus on the stories of the community as you can see in these pieces, um, social narratives, and I'm still hoping that my artwork will provide a more positive, equ equitable future. Um, I think that's very important uh, to be hopeful and you know to keep telling the stories of the community. Thank you. Yeah, I really admire how you kind of took the metaphorical quality of Box and Breakout and really expanded it into this um, narrative that you focused on. It's, it's, I think, really telling and 
people will um, appreciate it walking by. One uh, thing you and I have talked about a little bit in, in our studio visits is your interest in technology. Um, you, again, using the title Breakout or Box and Breakout, you reference this video game that you used to play when you were younger called Breakout that you <laughs> enjoyed playing and was really kind of influential, it sounds like, to you in your life. Um, so I was kind of interested in the role of technology in terms of negative or positive. Do you find it a hoop you have to jump through or do you find it something that you take inspiration from? Yeah, so again, that game uh, Breakout was one of the first games that I had. So we had this old black and white uh, UHF, VHF, TV. So there was actually, you know, the controllers on there. And you had to screw in the box to the back of the TV. I'm kind of telling my age here. Um, and so I just found it so mesmerizing because before that you had to go to an arcade or, you know, um, you had to go somewhere to play a video game. So that was like the first time um, you could play a video game at home. And it was very basic. It was just basically Pong, but they had rebranded it into Breakout. So I think technology and video games and um, things like that have always influenced me as an artist. Um, and then as thinking about technology today, um, I do use the computer a lot in my own work. So you can see, for instance, like the piece behind me and the other works that we just saw. Um, I use Binday dots to show kind of the graphic feeling. And I also collage the faces. So a lot of people ask me about the faces in the work, like uh, Ramir Bearden. I, uh, you know, take different pieces of magazines and different pieces that I find on the internet and collage them together. Um, and then I go into more of like the Andy Warhol, Roy Lichtenstein graphic style and add those designs and the bidet dots. Um, so I do start off on the computer after I do a basic sketch. But one of the things that I find if I'm working on the computer that um, it becomes kind of a hindrance to me at times because I'll spend so much time like, oh, what if I do this? And then let's do this and let's change the color. And then before I know it, I've spent all day working on, you know, one piece, keep reworking it. Whereas if I'm in my studio and I'm cutting up pieces, then, you know, I just put it on there and it's there forever. So I think technology um, is very important uh, in our age. And I also tell like my students and people that I love the age that we're living in now because you can access a museum on the computer. You can connect with a curator so you don't have to be in New York or California so I can be in Savannah or in South Carolina and be working with major museums and curators across the country. Um, or we could be on a Zoom uh, conference like we're doing now with um, people in Savannah and across the world. So I think technology is very important in helping us change the world and connect with each other. But again, you can't let it be a hindrance to getting out and communicating with people and, you know, also spending too much time on it. So I think it's just like anything, it's all about moderation. So like I tell people, I love sugar and chocolate chip cookies, but I'm not going to eat that three times a day. So I think it's the same thing with technology. You know, you just have to have that moderation. Yeah, I feel like museums are really kind of feeling that right now because we've had to transfer so much of our efforts to the digital world. Um, but you really can't feel that it completely replaces being in front of a piece of art and being in the museum. And I agree with you that it's nice in, in many ways, but you can't really replace that tangible quality like you were speaking about of putting something on a work or looking at a work in a gallery. Yeah, so for instance, uh, a Salvador Dali um, that I saw that I always um, saw like in the history books, I can't think of the name of the piece now, but I went to the Salvador Dali Museum in St. Petersburg and saw the actual piece. And I was just blown away by the size of it and the scope of it and 
again, you know, when you're seeing something in a book or online, it has no comparison to actual, you know, actually seeing the work. So, and a plug for, for my work. So definitely you have to go out and see it in person. It looks completely different than, you know, what you're seeing on the screen. I was about to say we had to place you in a lot of the pictures so that people could get a sense of the scale because you might not be able to get that from an image and they're really large. <laughs> oh yeah, and that's one of the things myself, I love working the larger. Um, I mean, I can work smaller like this piece behind me. So this is kind of like the average size and then there's the other piece on this size and we'll look at it at the end of the talk. Um, but I just feel more free and I just feel like I can express myself more in a larger piece. So again, I'm so glad to be able to show in museums and show in uh, larger areas where they can accommodate my work. Great. Well, I, again, everyone, you know, this is that plug to go see the works in person. So they kind of wow you with their scale and, and the layers mm -hmm. that you'll find. Uh, but I want to talk about the faces that are in your work um, because they really are kind of the predominant feature and you know we we're thinking back over the projects we've had um, in Box and Breakout before and we haven't had many figurative and very narrative works and yours have a lot of those elements to it so I wondered if you could just kind of speak to the faces that you chose and the idea of those like joyful faces and honestly the idea of fun because your works can be really fun they're colorful um, and beautiful and joyful. Yeah, I know personally, myself, people say, you know, that I'm kind of always in a good mood or I'm joyful. And that's sometimes I feel it difficult in today's world to have that mentality, um, you know, with everything going on. But for me, um, you know, I try to do affirmations and say, you know, positive things and um, let the universe know, you know, what I want to achieve. I think it's very important. Um, but in terms of the faces, I find it, um, that's my strength as an artist. I know some artists kind of focus on not so much negative, but kind of more of a somber, darker tone where, um, where I try to focus more on positivity and showing the stronger aspects of our community. So um, also I wanted to show younger people in the um, faces that you see in the, the windows. Um, again, I think by sh showing that, we can see ourselves in the work. Um, and I know a lot of times uh, as African-American male and as a younger artist as well, a lot of times you don't see those images, you know, in larger museums or art institutions. So um, again, I really try to push that and focus on that in the work. And I mean, I think that really leads into kind of the quote that Dr. Walls had in his um, reason for selecting your proposal, which was the idea that seeing oneself reflected in a collection, staff member, museum trustee on the walls of an art museum can be a really powerful experience. Um, and so I think it's really important that it is a diverse and accessible space for everyone. And so your inclusion of every, like all different types of people in your work is really important. Um, and can you speak a little more to the um, idea of not just including kind of these present day faces, but the like historical narratives you're including in the in the works? Yeah, so just like you said, kind of my connection to the Gullah Geechee culture, um, I wanted to really show that in some of the work so you could see that in some of the smaller details in the work, because I feel that Savannah has a very strong lineage of Gullah Geechee culture that's not really talked about um, too much. And as I was researching materials for the pieces, um, I found that almost every picture that I went back into had an African American doing something, um, you know, around Savannah or in the picture, which I was very surprised. I was like, oh, there's 
you know, this person here like working or this person in city market or on Broughton Street or at the train station. So um, I really wanted to show that and also show those historic buildings that people weren't that familiar with. So you can see the old um, train station, the old theater. Um, so some of those buildings that got demolished but were um, beautiful and um, strong aspects of the community. Um, and again, just the bases um, that I was showing in the work, again, I find it very important that, you know, if you're going into a museum and the museum is part of the community, that we should be able to see everyone in the community, uh, you know, in the museum. So as you're, you know, going in there, um, myself personally, when I've taken younger people, um, they had kind of the kind of mentality like, why should we be interested if we're not seeing ourselves or something that's related to us in the work? Um, so again, as a contemporary artist, I find that connecting with the community, showing the community is a very important aspect um, of an artist. Um, and I think that's something that we should do. We should be able to tell those stories in a creative way. Um, especially now um, in our current situation and, um, you know, in the current period that we're in. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it's so important that um, all, everyone's narratives be told uh, in an institution like a museum. Um, it's important that people see themselves reflected. Um, so it's, you know, of course, the reason we're so happy to have your works up as well to see those faces represented. Um, and it's something that, you know, we should continue to strive and work on um, in the museum field as a whole. Um, and I think what else I want to ask you, I always ask at the end, like, what is your main, what is your main desire for the impact of your project on the viewer? Do you have kind of an overarching goal of your works? What do you want the viewer to experience? Um, yeah, I think just looking at the work, um, first of all, I want to get the viewer's attention because as a teacher, I know you can't teach anything without first getting somebody's attention. Um, so I do that, <laughs> exactly, I do that by using bright colors, the color spectrum. So in the work, you can see um, that I use analogous colors, which are colors next to each other in a color spectrum, kind of like the rainbow. Um, so I use my color theory skills to make the artwork kind of seem brighter because they're next to each other. Um, and then also, again, I just want the viewer to be engaged when looking at the artwork. So at first, um, like many of my artworks, you'll see an overall image, but then as you look deeper into the image, you start to see other things, design, pictures, uh, different elements um, and I like to push the bounds between abstract and representational so representational is you know artworks that you can tell what it is right away so for instance behind me a face and then other parts of the artwork are just kind of paint splatters and designs so it's very abstract and um, not objective so um, again, I think I do that to kind of make the work more contemporary. Because um, I think a lot of people ask me about that too. They're always like, oh, there's just so much going on in your work. Um, why did you decide to do that? And I, again, I just think it makes it more engaging to the viewer. Um, and then uh, also, you know, they can always come back at a later date or they might be walking by one day and like, oh, I never saw that. You never, never saw that in the piece. Um, so um, and that's very important to me. The work's not stale and kind of um, boring. That's a good plug for people to walk by multiple times and bring their friends and see it again and again. Because like you said, there's always something new to discover. So I want to open up at this point um, questions from the audience. And I see that we already have one um, earlier uh, question. What other materials are used for your collages besides cardboard? How do you prep your canvas? 
What are certain colors chosen for your works? And where do you find photos to use? And do you need special permission from the subjects to use them? So there are a lot of questions wrapped in there. Oh. Let me know if you need me to repeat anything. Um, so what was the first question? I guess we'll just go down the line again. What are other materials you use for your collages besides cardboard? So I use like paper, um, comic books, um, pennies, pretty much anything that I find um, that I think is going to make the work more engaging and uh, add more layers to the work. Um, so pretty much anything that I can find. I'm, recently, I love using um, vintage comic books in my work because when I first graduated, I did some work with Marvel Comics and Top Comics. So I have like boxes and boxes of, of comic books. So I started using those uh, in my works um, as kind of the first layer. But I think anything, um, again, it's kind of thinking out of the box, thinking about work that, um, something that you want to use in the work that's gonna engage the viewer. I think that's my most important thing. We're trying to decide what to use. Um, this person also asked, where do you find your photos to use? Um, and do you need special permission from the subjects to use them? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I try not to use like a picture. So for instance, if we're sitting here, like a picture of you, Aaron. So if I was going to draw you directly, I would say, you know, can I have this permission? There was a, a couple of pictures um, that I got from Victoria Smalls, which is the um, history and um, cultural director at Penn Center of her parents. And they're um, a multi-race um, couple. And they were one of the first people in South Carolina to get married, even though it was against the law. So I found that that was a very important picture that I wanted to add to the pieces. Um, so to answer your question, if you are just using a, a random picture that, that you've taken of somebody, yes, you have to get their permission. But I think if you collage it and make it into my own person, like you can see behind me, uh, kind of like Ramir Burden or um, Mr. Brainwash is another artist um, that does that. Um, you're kind of making it into your own uh, person, so you don't have to get permission as much. Right. There's a long history of artists appropriating <laughs> images and turning them into their own. Um, mm -hmm. So we have another question, just if you could kind of, someone was asking you to talk about your early years as an artist, maybe kind of just how you've evolved in, in some of your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so earlier, um, I'll give my brief history. I started out as an artist, so my parents found out that I was interested in art, and we didn't have art in school, so I started taking artwork in West Palm Beach, Florida, where I'm from, at the Armory Art Center. Um, so I think I was seven or eight, and so I was in class, ceramic classes, and I had drawing classes with nudes. And so I remember the adults in the class were like, oh, he's just so professional. And he would just sit and draw the people like, um, of course I would. Like, what else am I going to do? Um, but very early, I had those skills. And then I also um, took a lot of computer classes. Um, so I had that uh, class with that first floppy disk um, on computer. So I was always very involved um, creatively um, and then when I was in uh, senior my artwork was chosen to be displayed at the Capitol so I got to meet Sarah Jessica Parker um, and she was a big influence uh, on my life and Maxine Waters I met her when I went to the Capitol um, so after that I was like you know this is uh, pretty cool you know I think I could do this you know, for the rest of my life. And so then I attended uh, Savannah College of Art and Design and studied uh, illustration and then decided to go get my master's degree um, because I think at the time 
uh, after I first graduated, I was like, you know, I'm done with school. I'm going to be this big, famous artist. And, you know, um, and then my parents decided that I need to get my master's degree because they said, you know, if you could really teach and focus on your own artwork. And they said the same thing. There's not a lot of African-American um, teachers out there. And, you know, they were teachers. So they were like, you know, you can kind of continue that and still have time to work on your own work. So I'm glad that I listened to them. And so I got my master's degree. And from there, I started showing uh, in different galleries and museums and doing a lot of art things while um, I was teaching. And I continue to teach now. And I find it very important, especially relevant in our current situation that we need more African-American teachers um, you know, in the community, especially at higher um, education institutions. Um, and I find it myself difficult um, to kind of um, be a part of that community wholly because I think a lot of the people in higher education they're not used to a younger, um, I guess, more hipper person, uh, you know, in the in the classroom. But um, I find it myself. It's very important that I'm there, and then also working on my own. So hopefully that wasn't too long. <laughs> the short feel of things. No, I'm sure everyone found that incredibly interesting. And I think, yeah, it is really important that you're in those rooms and, and being the, the hip one. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Can, let's see, uh, another question. When did Amiri finish these works? Were you adding the images right up into when you brought them into the museum to install them? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I was working up onto the last week and um, I like to say that I'm a creative procrastinator so um, <laughs> what I mean by that is I find that the work sometimes is stronger um, when I work on it like a little bit I worked on this like a couple weeks before rather than like a year or so um, ago because again something could happen in the world or you know i have a different mindset um than i did a year ago so i was working on the work right up to a couple of days before i installed the work um so you could see a couple of pictures of change i added a couple of um, pictures in there i won't tell you what it is but it does have to do with our current situation So pay close, especially in that first piece, um, that kind of indigo blue piece that has action 912. Um, and I wanted to really talk about that action 912 because I noticed that a lot of young people were going and taking action um, in our area that something I hadn't really seen before. So I really wanted to talk about that um, and show that visually. So that's kind of a treasure hunt for people to go find that image. I know exactly which one you're talking about, so I'm excited for other people to go um, explore that. And you can see a work that you're holding up right now. Can you explain what that work is, Amiri? Yeah, so I have my friend Carrie here. She went to grab it out of the studio. And so this is just one of the pieces that I was working on. I think a, a couple of people were asking, you know, what materials um, that I was using a lot of times in my work too. I uh, often will be inspired by nature. So this piece I was inspired by bees. I have some beehives um, in my yard, and I find it um, compelling how they transform the environment. And um, and also like a, it's funny people walk by and they're like, "Aren't you scared? They're they're going to sting you." I'm like, oh no, they're they're not scared. As long as you're I'm not scared as long as you're calm around them and you know that you're not going to do anything to them. They're not going to you know, pay you any uh, close attention. So I always had kind of this fear of bees or this misconception. And then um, as I was around them more, I decided 
um, found out how important they were and how they changed the environment. Um, but anyway, um, you could see all the different uh, layers and things in this piece. Um, you can kind of see how it's kind of thick on the side. So I can go in and make the artwork very um, deep and in depth. So this is one of the smaller pieces. <laughs> Yeah, and then kind of um, going off talking about the materials you're using, someone else was asking if you go through periods of working with certain colors. I know you talked a little bit about the colors and how in this particular one you were using analogous colors. Are there times when you just focus on blue or yellow? Do you have a Picasso blue period? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I recently had my blue period um, at the beginning of the year, and I believe those works are still on view at the International Trading Convention Center in Savannah. And so those were my indigo series. And in those series, I use actual uh, indigo um, powder to create the pieces. And I was very influenced by, of course, the Gullah Geechee culture, which was a big part um, of my earlier work. And I guess it still is. Um, but I remember saying that everyone was like, oh, you're in your blue period. Like every artist goes through those different periods. Um, and also, I was kind of inspired because it was the Pantone color of the year um, for 2020. Um, so, um, and I actually met the vice president of Pantone um, and showed her some of my work. And she was like, um, this is before the actual color was picked. Um, she was like, oh, I love that so much. And then it happened that that was the color of the year. So serendipity, I guess. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And indigo has such kind of a risk, rich history um, that you're able to kind of pull out through your works, sounds like. Mm -hmm. Another question here, could you speak more to the importance of video games in your work and in your life? What is it about video games that inspires you? Hmm. Yeah, so I think one of the things that inspires me is just and I'm also a musician, the music of games. So I just love that old like sonic um, music. And especially I found out that Michael Jackson created some of the songs in the first um, game. And then also the artwork is just those bright colors and just the way that it moves um, around. And currently um, I helped design a game with my friend and professor at the University of South Carolina, uh, Buford, um, Brian Canada, is called Bugs and Boo Hags. So you can um, look that up online. Um, and I'm also designing some other characters for um, some other games that are gonna be coming out. So it's just one of the things that's, you know, kind of a hobby, but also, you know, something that inspires me, but definitely the, old 8-bit fun games. I don't like the new shoot 'em up bang bang games that you go on there and stuff. I like very creative, fun, um, you know, um, old school games. I'm definitely a, an, a, an Atari Nintendo person. I think that just continues to speak to how creative you are as a person that you're also involved in the video game world and video game characters. <laughs> It's a whole new facet to your work. Oh, and I, and I guess I'll make a plug for the Pulse um, Festival. Uh, that's something that comes to the Telfair every year that I also attend. And I know Harry Delorme works very hard on putting that together. Um, so that's also a big inspiration when I go see, um, you know, the things there in the museum. And I'm like, oh, wow, look at what people are doing with technology and video games. So. Um, I find that um, very inspiring as well. Um, someone asked here, who are your influences? Uh, if you could respond to that internationally, nationally, and locally, if you have an answer to that. Oh, um, so my influences as an artist, like I said earlier, like uh, Ramir Burden, uh, like uh, Jasper Johns, I'm very into the pop artist. Um, Andy Warhol, Basquiat is a big influence. Um, a lot of people compare me to him the way that I use um, kind of my painterly palette. Um, so those are kind of the international artists. 
um, locally, um, you know, like Jonathan Green, who's a, a good friend of mine, who's a Gullah Geechee artist. Um, let's see who else locally inspires me. Um, there's so many like great artists. I would say the artists of our groups uh, support low country artists. They're Natalie Days, Mitt Nelson, um, Calvin Woodham. Um, and some other people, I'm trying to remember everybody, um, but those people, um, you know, we work really well as a group um, and they're a big influence uh, on my life. Um, and let's see, it's an internationally local and what was the, the other question? Nationally. Nationally. So I think you kind of responded to that. Right, <laughs> yeah, somebody right now. Um, that I like, I guess I would say like Mr. Brainwash or Banksy, just because, and I'd say more Banksy just because, uh, or Cause is another one. They've become kind of like a household thing. So hopefully one day, you know, become a household name artist as well. An artist is very recognized uh, around the world. Um, so I'm most often, um, surprised how those artists, you know, make made those connections, you know, all around the world, and also made those connections with younger people. Um, I find that very um, relevant. Thanks for sharing all that with us. Yeah, I think definitely your work has some graphic similarities um, to the artists that you mentioned. Uh, thinking of Banksy and also focusing on con social justice issues as well um, in terms of your subject matter. So um, if anyone else has any questions, we have about three minutes left. So please go ahead and submit those. Um, someone asked if you made the mask that you're wearing at the beginning of the presentation. <laughs> oh, I have it right here. No, I didn't make this mask. Actually, my friend, um, Mary Mack, uh, gave this to me. She is the director of the Red Piano 2 Gallery, which recently just closed in St. Helena, um, South Carolina. But I have a big collection of um, African masks. So uh, um, we'll often wear these in my work. Or like I said, I'm also uh, a musician. So I have a couple of videos that I wore the mask in. Um, but this is a, um, I'm trying to remember the tribe of the mask will come to me um but yeah and so i like to tell people this is my socially distance distancing mask so instead of wearing that boring thing i'll put this on and go out six feet away <laughs> well um if there are no more <coughs> questions Amiria, do you have anything final that you'd like to say to the audience? Um, no, I think that's it. I think I was going to try to show the piece um, behind me. So I know there was a couple of pieces there. So I know a couple of people were asking me about the size of the work here. So um, you can really see the size. and. Um, using the emojis and the work to kind of make it more graphic. And again, there's some hidden images. Um, so you can see kind of the uh, hummingbird here. And you can see the old Dunbar um, theater, which is like an African American theater um, pictured there. And, um, and if you zoom in, Closely down here, we can see the old Telfair um, Museum there. So I wanted to incorporate that. So um, maybe we can find some way to display this <laughs> somewhere to you or they can stop by the studio to see it. And this is the brown bag piece here. Um, so you zoom in closely and kind of see the bag here. So this actual brown bag uh, on the piece. So that's uh, some of the work. 
Thank you so much for sharing and thank you everyone for attending this virtual artist talk. It's been really incredible to um, talk with Amiri this way and share his work this way. And again, I hope you will go by the Jepson Center and see it in person and discover all those layers and, and meanings that he's hidden throughout the works. Um, so thank you again. Uh, please be sure to check out our website and Facebook page for upcoming events. Um, we have another lecture on June 18th at 5 p.m. for Juneteenth. So um, it's in the chat and you can also find that information on our Facebook page. So thank you all so much for attending. We really, really appreciate it. Yes, and definitely make sure you go to that Juneteenth festival. It happens every year. It's a wonderful um, festival and um, I think it's very important again especially in our current climate and thank you Aaron so much for taking the time to talk with me and just help me with the whole project and everything you've been wonderful and it's been great to getting to know you a little bit better yeah, of course. And hopefully we can continue to work together in the future. Um, and I'm so excited for everyone to see the, the work at the Jepson Center. That's the one thing I really love about this Foxton Breakout Project is it introduces me to a lot of artists I, I didn't know um, and I should know um, and I get to know uh, through it. And, mm -hmm. and so I encourage, you know, this is an annual project, so I encourage people to submit if they're interested. Um, and go see Amiri's installation. Break out. Break out. Thank you all.